Yeah, a hearty welcome to one and all uh, to the concluding session of the Earth Science Week 2020. What a wonderful week we have had with exceptional speakers who touched upon an assorted array of topics like earthquakes, tsunamis, atomic minerals, the elusive dinosaur to maps and archaeology, as well as oceans and their ever-altering dynamics. Today, we have been graced by the presence of an esteemed guest from Brazil, uh, Chair International Geoscience Education Organization, Professor Roberto Greco. Sir, on behalf of each one of us here, I extend a warm welcome to you. Our main speaker for today's session is Dr. Leslie Allenberg from Australia, who will be throwing light upon the topic, Volcanic Vital Science, Taking the Pulse of Sleeping Giants. I invite Dr. Ajit Vartak to kindly please introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Allenberg. Good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Leslie Amber. She did her master's and PhD from Department of Geology and Geophysics, University of Alaska, Fairbanks. Her MSc thesis title was Hydrovolcanism, Okmo Caldera, Alaska. And her PhD thesis was based on investigations of four shallow conduit systems, one from Japan, one from Russia, and two from USA. Uh, from 2009 to 2014, she was lecturer at Department of Applied Geology, Curtin University of Technology. Then 2014 to 2020, she was sessional academic, Department of Earth, Atmospheric Environment at Monash University. 2016 to present, she is working as Deputy Director, Australian Earth and Environmental Science Olympiad team. 2017 to present, she is working as teacher, Earth Science Education Program, Victoria State Coordinator. She has received many award, honors and awards. Some of them are Curtin Teaching Citation, Curtin University, 2011, School of Science and Engineering Teaching Award, Curtin University, 2011, Citation for Outstanding Contribution to Students Learning, Australian Government Office for Learning and Teaching, 2012. Uh, with this short introduction, now I request Dr. Leslie to deliver her talk, Volcanic Vital Science, Taking the Pulse of Sleeping Giants. Leslie. Thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful welcome. Uh, and thank you very much to everyone um, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be part of this international collaboration and uh, this event, this Earth Science Week event in India. Uh, it was much easier to get through customs this way. Um, so I wanted to try to touch on the, the broad subject of volcanoes and volcanology. It is a extremely broad and complex topic. It is one that we could spend weeks talking about. And as most of my former students will tell you, I can certainly go on for many hours about this, but we have less than one hour today. So I wanted to really focus on storytelling and things that most people are not aware of or some common misconceptions. Um, I know that this is a, a general audience. And so I would like to begin with uh, introducing the, the basics of how volcanoes work at a very, very surface level um, and into the guts of the volcanoes. And then we'll go on. I need to switch. There we go. Um, so we'll start with simply where we find volcanoes and then look at why they can form there, why they don't just pop up everywhere on Earth. And then focus on the types of eru eruptions that we can get from different types of volcanoes and what sort of hazards there are to, to humans, to infrastructure, uh, to animals um, and air traffic. I noticed I, I did a quick poll on Twitter and I asked uh, people what sort of things they would like to hear in a talk like this. And many people said that they really wanted to know what, what about the life cycle of a volcano? How does it go from in, its infancy uh, into old age and then on into um, being deceased as it were? So I'll spend a bit of time on that. Um, and I really want to look at volcanic monitoring because this is really the interface between the activity of volcanoes and the science of volcanology and the public, the broad public. And so I think it's really a, a, an important thing for as many people as possible to understand what the science is and how the scientists work together 
with things like aviation uh, authorities and, and other um, services to, to try to prevent loss of life and to protect infrastructure as much as possible. And I'd like to end this talk with some of my favorite volcano stories. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of the most important eruptions that have occurred over the last hundred years. Um, and so I'm just gonna pick four of my personal favorites and so hopefully it'll be a chance um, to um, initiate some conversations and questions about um, places that I've been and worked. So the main places where we find volcanoes are, is largely coincident with where we also find earthquakes. This map here shows uh, a record of about 40 years worth of earthquakes and volcanic activity. Um, the, the large yellow dots there are sulfur dioxide plumes and the size of that tells about the amount of sulfur dioxide uh, released in a particular eruption. The red triangles hiding behind those show the places of active volcanism and the blue dots show us where there have been earthquakes recorded. And we see that there's a, generally a pattern that while some of the earthquakes are more diffuse, they tend to follow certain lines and those lines are coincident with where we find most of the volcanoes. And we can see just from this basic geophysical and geochemical data that we can collect that there are patterns that relate to geography. And so we can then turn this into a, a, a more concise map of where we find the volcanoes. And we see that there are really three pr primary regions where we find volcanoes. So they're not all over the globe. They're, they're along some very specific uh, zones. Now, the main ones is where we have two plates coming together and one sliding beneath the other one. This is what we call a subduction zone. Um, so when we have one plate that is denser than the other, it can, it can go underneath that. This allows for new material to be added to that region and through some chemical changes and the changes in pressure as we go down underneath that plate, we release the water that is held in the hydrous minerals that were in the plate that was subducted. This then can feed into that. We'll go into this process a little bit more in a moment. There are also places where plates are pulling apart and we don't see a lot of um, really centralized volcanoes. We see a lot of, sort of rift volcanoes and this is where we just have, a, um, by and large, have a lot of continuous volcanism, predominantly under the ocean floor but in a few places such as um, the East African Rift. And finally, we have places where there is mantle material. So the layer underneath the Earth's crust, where we have that, that mantle material being brought up through a number of different processes. And we have places at hot spots such as Hawaii, um, Iceland, um, the Galapagos, oops, down here, um, Azores, and these, these regions are also places where we find types of volcanoes. So for those of you who don't have a background in plate tectonics, just a brief look at very generally where do we find these different types of, um, of plate boundaries. Uh, in blue, we have our convergent uh, subduction zones. So you see they typically make these arcuate shapes that we have here around the Western Pacific. And all along these, we have large stratovolcanoes, beautiful conical shapes, lots of active volcanism because the Pacific plate is subducting around that Western edge at a, at a fairly fast clip. Also on underneath the uh, South American plate, we have the Nazca plate is subducting under that. In other places, we have a rifting where we have these red, red and black lines and we see that they're all offset. Um, and that offset is important because we have to remember that we're always working on a sphere or a, a spherical shape um, with our globe. It's not just a, a flat map. So we, we end up with offset along those places where we have the, um, uh, the spreading ridges. All right, so it's just a very, very general, very quick introduction to plate tectonics, just to give you a little bit of framework if you're not familiar. Now there are really three mechanisms to form magma. And this is one thing that is maybe sometimes a misconception with understanding how we form volcanoes because when we think of melting, 
we tend to use our own personal experience and mel melting and, and human experience has to do with adding heat to something, making something warmer. If you have ice and the sun shines on it, the ice might melt. If you have a bar of chocolate and you want to make uh, a cake or you want to make a, a fondue, then you're going to melt the chocolate over a low heat. Um, butter, all, all of the things that we're familiar with in baking, if we're melting something, we are cranking up the temperature and then changing the, the phase of that. But that's actually a very difficult thing to, to do on earth to just turn up the temperature. And so most volcanoes actually don't form by that process of, of increasing the temperature locally. Um, I've got a, a number of phase diagrams here. And for those of you who may be um, not, not familiar with reading these, I'll just orient them. On the left-hand side of each, we're going from the top uh, would be the, the surface of the earth. And down that left-hand side, we're getting increasing um, depth beneath the earth's surface down to 150 kilometers in each one of these scenarios. Now the red line represents the normal temperature gradient as you, you go down into the earth. It, it generally gets hotter um, to, to a limit. And the green line is this solidus point. And that would be the point, if you're thinking about it in terms of something more familiar like butter, where you take the butter out of the, the freezer or the, out of the refrigerator, the butter is solid. So all of it would be on the left-hand side of that. And then if you took it to its melting temperature and it just started to melt, it would be on that solidus line. And then as it all turned to liquid, it would be on the right-hand side. So as we increase the temperature of it. So in order for rock to melt, we have to have the, the temperature locally needs to be on the right-hand side of that solidus line. So there are three ways that we can change this intersection. By decompressing the, the material, we actually, we artificially change what the, the solidus, I'm sorry, what the geotherm is. We, we bring hotter material up towards the surface, we decompress that material, um, and we cross the solidus line. So we can have a very small amount of partial melting occurring. Now there's, um, there's often a, a concept that, you know, to make a volcano, you, you melt everything, but generally we're actually talking about very small partial melts. Um, and so the, the material in the mantle is not being whole, whole scale melted and then, and then erupted at the surface. We're melting a portion of that, changing the composition um, with what comes out at the surface. Another way to do that, yes, we can increase the temperature by, by another way is of the mantle upwelling. So we're bringing very, very hot material up from great depth um, in these kind of like a blowtorch, uh, melting up all the way, not melting through, but um, convecting through the mantle and bringing very hot material, which then melts the crustal material sitting above it. So here again, we're changing the geotherm but uh, in a slightly different regime than we did with our mid-ocean ridge. The last way, and this is actually how most magmas on Earth, um, well, okay, the, the ocean floor is a very large percentage of the magmas that are generated, but we really don't think of our ocean floor as one giant pile of volcanic material, but it is. Um, so the, the volcanoes that we're used to seeing at the surface, um, our beautiful stratovolcanoes um, are, generated actually by what we call a flux melting. Now for people who live in colder climates where you get ice on the roads, um, you may be familiar with adding salt to that in order to decrease the, the freezing temperature so that the, the ground is not frozen. Um, in the same way, adding water to the mantle decreases its uh, melting temperature. And so here you see that we've now moved that green line out over to the left. So we've changed what the solidus temperatures are um, because we now have a, a different composite material with the add water mixed and added into that. So at, with one very important thing to note here, and especially for the, the earth science educators with us today, is that the downgoing slab does not melt. Okay, it is not the subducted slab melting here there is water being released from the minerals within that subducting slab. So we have all sorts of hydrous minerals that have formed on the ocean floor. 
those become physically unstable. They release a huge amount of water into the mantle wedge that decreases the temp melting temperature of that mantle material and then releases that, uh, then the, we have plumes of that material, that melted material can come up and then form new magmas closer to the surface. So those are the, the three primary ways by which we form magma to begin with. Then what happens to it depends on where it comes out at the surface and what else is going on. So there are two very basic divisions that we can make in our eruption type. So we can either have very exciting explosive eruptions or we can have very calm, quiet, effusive eruptions. Now most eruptions will actually have a mix of behavior. Um, so they may have, we may start with a little explosive um, ex eruption uh, and then turn into lots and lots of effusive activity. And I'll talk then about how we can actually transition from effusive back into more explosive um, activity. Um, and we can also have long-lived effusive eruptions where then there may be some interactions with groundwater or surface waters that can make more explosive um, events. In general though, we, we look at what the overall behavior of the, the entire event is, and we're really looking at, at quite um, high level of explosion. So we may see sort of dramatic little bursts and many people were, were sort of shocked by some of the things that occurred say at White Island last year at Fa'akatane. Um, and that was still actually considered to be an extremely small event. Um, the, the small ash plume that, sorry, the small, small steam plume that came out of that only went up a few hundred meters. So when we're talking about explosive eruptions, we're really only looking and considering things that go up to two kilometers or around about two kilometers at least. Uh, as we get into larger and larger er eruptions, as we see in um, uh, this diagram here on the lower right hand side, we're talking about things that start to reach up into the stratosphere. And then we start to have major atmospheric interactions. Um, the division here is between things that interact with groundwater at the top, so the Surtsean and Phreatoplanian. So they interact with either seawater or groundwater. To, to generate very explosive things, even with small amounts of magma, um, simply because of the uh, sort of pressure cooker effect of having steam that is trapped and under very high pressure and then catastrophically released. So more specifically about explosive eruptions, the main thing that controls how explosive an eruption is or whether or not it's explosive is that we have some sort of strong, or we have, like to say closed container um, that then explodes. And, and my favorite way, again, if we've got um, science educators here who are thinking of activities that they would like to do with their students, um, I invite you to, if you can find them, they're out there somewhere, um, little, the old film canisters, once upon a time, where we went around and we had actual film to put into, into cameras. Um, we had, and geologists love them, the film canisters made fantastic um, uh, sample containers. But if you take one uh, film canister and you put an Alka-Seltzer tablet in that, I don't know how that translates uh, globally, but I think Alka-Seltzer is pretty, pretty widely found, um, and a bit of water and you close the lid really tight, uh, you can let sit that on the table and ask students what you think that might happen with that. Um, and you take another one and you put it into a container that has a few holes drilled in the side and, and see what happens. And very, you get very different types of eruptions. And I've managed to hit the ceiling of a um, lecture theater with the closed container before, um, a, a very large lecture theater with very high ceilings. So you can make quite a large explosive eruption um, just with an Alka-Seltzer tablet and a, um, and a, a film canister. And it's the same type of thing. We have gas pressure building up in a, in a tightly contained uh, environment. So when we have the, the bedrock, which um, the volcano is sitting in and the edifice, if it's not allowing a lot of those gases to be released, um, then we're going to end up with some sort of explosion. And by doing this, we're actually fragmenting both solid rock that was pre-existing and the magma that, it's, um, that is there. So we get, shards of uh, pre-existing rock, we get individual crystals, we get ash, which is a mixture of both. 
um, and we get pumice or scoria depending on the, the flavor of magma that we're erupting. Um, this, it, these explosions can actually occur right within the vent itself. Um, so they can, they can occur kind of at any point along the, the magma, uh, sorry, the volcanic plumbing system, or they can actually occur by the collapse of the ash plume. So what we're seeing on, in these photos on the right-hand side, I'm sorry, I believe that the top photo is Merape um, from the MVO uh, observatory where we have a small explosion and then the, the, the plume itself is actually collapsing and that is generating, um, that's actually releasing more gas by the, the rocks that are in that small eruption coming apart. Um, and then the, the lower image is from the Icelandic eruption, the Eigefa <laughs> Jökull, I'll give my best shot, um, eruption uh, from about I don't know, maybe 12 years ago. Um, where we had a volcano erupting underneath a glacier. And so obviously a glacier is a great source of water and you have a huge amount of interaction then with the, the water that's melting off of the glacier and having the very hot magma coming up to the surface and interacting with that and creating a very explosive event. Now, when we talk about the size of eruptions, and, and then when I get into a bit more of the storytelling, I'm going to be looking at this, the, um, the, the size of these different eruptions. There are two things to keep in mind. One is that when you're trying to measure something that ends up all over the world, it's, um, it might seem like a bit of a, a neat trick to figure out how much actually came out. Um, but there are a number of different things that we can actually measure. And, and one thing that is, is quite consistently found is that there is a, a systematic decrease in the thickness of the deposit. And so you can actually model how much material has come out um, and you can look at the area over that it has covered. Um, now we actually use very high um, resolution satellite tracking to know exactly how much ash is in the atmosphere at any time. So we can then take that all and um, and model it as a single cube. Um, so we look at if you took out all of the bubbles and you took out all of the, the, in, the spaces between the bits, what would be the, the, what we call the dry rock equivalent of all of that? So when you look at these numbers here on this infographic, um, we're talking about um, an approximation of a very large volume um, based on the relationships of how that material has been dispersed and how much gas and, and other spaces would be in there, all condensed into one. Um, so these are the, 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 that's one way of looking at it. And this is something that is probably more important to mo most volcanologists. Um, the more broadly um, used term now is the volcanic explosivity in index. I'll go into that now in more detail. So this was a way of comparing eruptions from different places and different points in time. And obviously we're not going to have uh, personal records. We're not going to have satellite images of eruptions that occurred 600,000 years ago. And so we have uh, a number of geologic tools in order to get the best estimate of how much material would have been erupted from that. So we can use that volume. If we have any sort of um, record that's going to show us the, the height of the eruption cloud, so that can actually be determined by how far away we find the materials. Um, so if material doesn't actually get to the, the um, tropopods, we don't, it, it isn't dispersed globally. So if we find ashes from an eruption, um, say in Indonesia, in a glacier on the other side of the world, like in Patagonia, um, then we can correlate that and say, okay, well, it had to have been dispersed that, that far. Um, and so we, we can actually get an estimate of the eruption height based on where we find ashes and what the, how thick those layers of ashes are as well. And then obviously for modern eruptions, we take all sorts of qualitative information about that as well. And we put this together to um, talk about these, to compare 
so we're really comparing apples and apples. What is the, the size of this eruption? So how explosive is it? Um, and you'll see, start to see some names here. So Mount St. Helens, um, these are very rough. Um, so they've sort of rounded up for everything. This is given here as one cubic kilometer on the last screen, it was I think 0.74. Um, again, this is more sort of, we like to, to throw darts at our, our dartboard and, and get nice and close. Um, Pinatubo here shown as, as being 10 kilometer cubic kilometers. Um, and that was a, um, quite a dramatic eruption. I'll talk about both of those uh, in my storytelling at the end. Now, effusive eruptions are tend to be what sticks out in most people's mind. You, when people ask me like, you know, oh, they say, oh, you're a volcanologist. Like, have you ever, have you ever seen lava? <laughs> have you ever, and this is what they think of. I won't go to this video. Um, if you really want to the, the wonderful um, sen sensory experience of, of watching lava flowing, um, the USGS has some fantastic uh, videos from the eruption a couple of years ago in Hawaii. And yes, I have gone out and sampled the lava flows on, on Hawaii as they were flowing down. It is very hot. It is relatively dangerous. But what most people don't think about is that unless you have a, a really massive eruption like this one here in, in 2018 um, that becomes channelized, lava actually flows fairly slowly. And uh, you know you, you can see it coming <laughs> and you can walk away. Um, it, and as it gets farther and farther from its source, it travels more slowly and more slowly. Uh, and so it's not the sort of thing that it, you know, it doesn't sort of like come out and, and get you. Um, you can get away from it. And so um, when people think about volcanic ha hazards, lava is always the first thing that seems to pop to everyone's mind. And yet it is probably one of the easiest to, to plan and mitigate against and to know what's coming and where it's coming and to, um, to intervene with that hazard. What a lot of people don't think of are lava flows that look like these two. So on the upper left-hand side, this is one of my photos from the, the summit of Unzen Volcano in Kyushu, Japan. And we'll talk a bit more about that eruption at the end. Um, but this, this spine, it, it's, it's a little bit misleading here because it looks like this gentleman from the um, Japanese ge uh, Geologic Survey is standing right next to the base of it, but he's actually quite a distance from that. I'm way far back. This, this spine is actually about 100 meters high. And this was the final eruption and it just pushed this great spike up out of the ground. It's really quite phenomenal. There's actually another one on the other side you can't see. Um, it sort of mirrors it. And, and these two huge spines just, just came out as the solid rock at the, at the surface. Um, and below that, we have the, what was sort of one of the domes that came out of uh, Mount St. Helens. And this was a, sorry, somebody's not muted. Can we make sure everyone's muted, please? It's very distracting. No, 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 but you can continue, Leslie. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when they, um, in the more recent eruptions in the 2000s of Mount St. Helens that have been filling in the, the crater um, from the eruption, the cataclysmic eruption in 1980, which I'll talk about later, um, you can see that all around this dome, like the, this dome is hot, it's fresh. You, there's, there's a sulfur dioxide, a little bit of sulfur dioxide coming off of that. It's a fresh dome that's just erupted. It's hot in the center, but it's cool enough around the edges that there is a glacier wrapped all the way around it. And that glacier is not really very bothered by it. Um, it's mostly just been pushing itself up out of that. There's going to be some melting around the very edges of it there. Um, but the glacier is largely unperturbed as this spine continues to, to push out. So lavas can actually just look like solid rock as they come out. They don't necessarily flow like what we see in Hawaii. So there are a variety of volcanic hazards and I've, I've touched on some of these, but just to really put it clear what the, the primary ones are. And I've, I've tried to list them in terms of what I really see as being the, the most critical ones and the ones that we really are concerned about when it comes to mitigating a disaster. The main one is pyroclastic flows. 
And the reason that pyroclastic flows are, are so dangerous is because one, they can initiate very unexpectedly and with very little warning. Um, and two, they move very fast. Um, I'll give some more specifics about those in a second. Lahars also uh, move very, very quickly. They're essentially just mud flows. They can be very hot. Um, we also have, of course, ash fall and ash will impact things much farther away from the, the volcano than these other ones will. Volcanic bombs um, are basically controlled. These, these are great if you want to do a, a different types of a physics problem for your student. You can talk about the trajectory of a volcanic bomb because it's a perfect um, mechan physics mechanics uh, problem to do that has a little bit of earth science flavor to it. Um, so they don't go very far, but if you are close enough to one, it's definitely going to ruin your day if you're not wearing a, a helmet. Um, even if you are wearing a helmet, it might ruin your day. Um, and then obviously lava flows, uh, as I just talked about, and then volcanic gases. And volcanic gases are one that people often don't think about. Um, this is certainly uh, at the, the White Island disaster, what killed most people was um, breathing in these, um, so perhaps it was a, the carbon dioxide, um, any, any of these, uh, ones that are, are listed at the bottom here, the sulfur dioxide um, the, and all of these horrible acids, they can be extremely painful. Um, having personally uh, ingested a little bit of these at, at one volcanic vent, um, even when we were given a warning, uh, an alarm went off and we, we booked it away from the crater as quick, quickly as we could, just a few seconds of breathing those in caused shortness of breath, um, irritation in your throat, and, and you can just feel your, your lungs absolutely burning just from a few moments. So anything more than a minute or two of exposure to these gases can be deadly. Um, and there are examples where there have been non-eruptive events where people have died from overturn of lakes that had volcanic gases um, trapped, so crater-like, where these dense gases were, were building up and building up something perturbed the lake, it overturned, and you had these very dense uh, gases flowing down the side and, and killing people and leaving, really leaving no trace. So there are, and now, you know, we know that these things can occur and we monitor them much more closely. So a bit more specific about some of these types of hazards. Um, pyroclastics are, pyroclastic flows are very destructive because they are incredibly hot. They are full of superheated gases, which can run at temperatures upwards over 100 degrees Celsius. And you have this hot mix of gas and rock fragments and ash. And if they flow over other water, they can flash that to steam and add more energy to itself. And they effectively are moving on almost a frictionless plane because of the, the dynamics between those gases and the, the surface beneath them. So they move incredibly quickly and go up to, they've been clocked at speeds of up to 700 kilometers per hour. And even a, a slow moving pyroclastic flow is gonna be moving at hundred kilometers an hour. So one, you're never going to personally outrun it. And there's simply not a lot of time to uh, warn people and to get them out of the way. And this is why evacuation prior to an eruption that could generate pyroclastic flows is so essential. Um, now, we're able to use a lot of geologic tools to look into the, the past of, of, an, of a volcano uh, and to understand its history and have a good sense of whether it's likely to produce these or not and how far they're likely to travel from that particular edifice. So it's, um, it is something that we can predict is likely to happen at, at a volcano, but we can't necessarily say when a pyroclastic flow will be generated. Now it can either be generated, as I said before, by the eruption column collapsing back down on itself. Um, I haven't included it, but it's one of the most famous pictures that gets thrown around of volcanic ash clouds and or volcanic eruption is Mount Redoubt. And, and it's talking about this eruption plume, but the picture is actually the, the pyroclastic flow is what we call the elutriated or the, the swept up ashes from the pyroclastic flow that's making the really dramatic cloud behind it. Um, so that's that column, um, because it's this mixture of um, supersonic 
gases and rocks and ash being spewed out of this vent is like a, a basically like shooting a bullet straight up. Eventually it's gonna reach a point where gravity is working on it more than the thrust behind it and it's gonna to start to collapse down. So this, you have this huge mass of, of rock and ash and, and hot gases that falls back down on itself and generates a pyroclastic flow like these ones at Mayon. Um, we can also have the, as I showed at Unzen, large spines of very hot rock um, that are trapping tons of very hot gases inside of them. And as those become over steepened, gravity is pulling that rock apart and then allowing that explosion to occur by, by breaking the container. Now, this, the, the way that these behave on the ground is then also dictated by the topography. So the, the dense lower portion of the flow will follow stream beds, so it'll be um, basically just channelized. But the, the upper portion that still has tons of smaller particles and, and hot gases can just absolutely go straight line. Um, so there's no real protection from uh, large you know, cliffs or valley walls from that upper part of it. Now, lahars are, uh, this is a, an Indonesian term that's specific to a volcanic mud flow. And these can either be generated during an eruption or, or they can be generated by just um, mixing of those pyroclastic materials. So we may have a pyroclastic deposit that's been uh, laid down and then we have a big rain event that happens anytime later that reworks and remobilizes that material. There's tons and tons of loose material and that can then be, come flowing down off of this steep slope. Now the, the hot ones obviously have the, the added danger of that they can cause immediate burns to people. They can even be hot enough to char wood that sometimes. Um, and you can see in these two photos here, they cause major damage to infrastructure. Uh, the upper left hand photo is from Mount St. Helens 1980 eruption. And you can see that this steel bridge has just been crumpled like a child's toy. Um, and it's moving boulders. I mean, the, all of the boulders in this picture have been moved, have been just carried down um, many kilometers away from the eruption vent. Um, so they have an enormous carrying capacity um, and, and hence why they're so destructive. Um, the lower one is from, is, lower image is from one of the many, many uh, devastated areas after the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption, um, where bridges have just been absolutely obliterated, whole communities buried. Um, yeah, and, and at, at the, uh, I'll talk more about the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in a minute, but um, the Lahars were so devastating because they continued to flow down that mountain for up decades after um, the main eruption. And so some communities had to be moved multiple times uh, because of this. And it really, it's like concrete when it, when it sets. Um, and so it, there's no <laughs> easy way away from them. Um, ash is the most widespread uh, hazard and the main, um, thing that is, is impacted by it is, of course, aviation. Um, and so because it, um, I mean, if you have a lot of ash fall very close, you can have problems with um, crops being destroyed. You can have damage to especially electronics and machinery. Um, but for the most part, ash that falls locally is actually sort of a long-term boon. It's, um, it fertilizes your fields, it fertilizes your crops, it may kill them in that first season. But typically what happens is then the next season it is actually even, you get a better crop. Um, so short, long-term game for short-term pain. Um, it's very different from wood ash. Um, it isn't so fine and powdery. Um, it is a, this less than two millimeter down to sort of micron sized particles. And it's very sharp because it is essentially um, similar to obsidian. It depends on the composition, but you can ha you have very, very fine, razor sharp, tiny edges of volcanic glass. 
you can have individual mineral grains and then of course rock fragments and it's just all mixed in together. Now, when a plane flies through an ash plume, um, this of course it has effects on all of the electronics. So it affects the navigation. Um, it can coat the windscreen and, and that obviously then makes it impossible to see where you're going. Um, it abrades all the surfaces of, well, of most of the materials um, on, the, on an aircraft. And if enough ash is actually ingested into a jet engine, which operates at a, a temperature that is right around the melting point of most ashes, it will liquefy that ash. And then as that moves through the turbine to the back, which is a, the cooler portion of the engine, the, the ash then, the, the glass then solidifies on the, uh, the backside of the turbine. And that's why a jet engine stops. And so um, early in our avi aviation ash interactions, um, we had, there were many instances of pilots trying to crank up the jets and move faster or to climb higher, which actually exacerbated that problem because then the jets were operating at higher temperatures and melting more of that ash. And now the as much now we have very good tracking of ash globally, and we're able to by and large divert air traffic away from these um, ash plumes. Um, but it, when uh, there is an encounter, the advice is then to actually try to to fly below it to decrease the operating temperature of the of the engines. Um, when there's a lot of ash fall locally, we can also have um, structural failures. So just like having a massive dump of snow on a building um, that then uh, has rain on top of it, we can have roof collapses uh, and then breathing in too much of this can, can actually have the same effect as working in mines um, and getting silicosis. And I'm realizing that I'm going a lot slower <laughs> than I had anticipated. So I'm actually gonna skip um, over the volcanic life cycles. We started a bit late, so I'm sorry. I'm going to actually not go through the life cycle, but and I'm gonna talk about what the type, topic of the, of the talk was, which is our vital signs. So I like to think of this analogy. Everyone's familiar with how uh, a, a medical doctor will look at your vital signs to try to understand your health and to figure out, you know, are you going to get diabetes or, or health or heart disease? Um, in very much the same way, we take all sorts of information from volcanoes in order to understand what they are likely to do and when they're likely to do it. So the geology side of this is very much like taking the medical history. Geologists, as we go out and we, we map the area around a volcano and we look at as much of, of its um, family history as we can get. How often does it erupt? How big are those eruptions? You know, does it look like there's a lot of small eruptions in between big ones or does it just kind of do those? So that's, that's what I think of as sort of the medical history. What's it likely to do? Then seismic monitoring is very much about this real time, looking at the, the heart rate or the pulse of that volcano. And the more we have seismometers on and around volcanoes over a long time, we actually get a very good sense of like, what's its resting heart rate? And what does it do before it starts to wake up? Very much like having a person. Some people have higher heart rates and you know, if you didn't know that about that person and you just took their heart pulse all of a sudden, you'd be like, oh my gosh, this person is having a problem. But if you knew that they always had a higher heart rate, you'd be like, oh, okay, that's totally fine. Um, geodetic information. So using like size, um, sorry, GPS, a very high um, resolution GPS, we can me measure millimeter size ground motions. And this is very much like looking at the breath rate. Oftentimes before an eruption, a volcano will, will inflate. Um, and we look at the tilt um, of the ground around that to see how much new material is coming up into it. I can obviously use thermal, um, and I'll talk a bit more about those techniques. Um, temperature, same thing as taking your own temperature. Are you healthy? Are you not? Visual, behavioral, is this thing acting erratic? You know, is this uh, out, of, out of the norm for it? Um, infrasound, so, you know, that, is it coughing? Is it, you know, like the, when the doctor listens to your, to your back and your chest, you know, is everything all right in there? It's very much what we're doing with the infrasound. Um, and things like taking gas chemistry or other geochemical measurements is like taking the blood work of a volcano is you're looking at 
what's what's going on in there right now by taking this tiny sample and is that at background or is that changing does that show us that there's some sort of unrest so there's uh, two main types of seismicity that's um, are, that are uh, associated with a volcano waking up. One of these volcano tectonic earthquakes, which are a little fracturing. And I really encourage people to go to this IRIS website if they want to know more about this, because it's a beautiful little animation that I won't show today. But these are little fractures that are happening within the volcano itself. They're not big tectonic events. Um, and they're showing that there's rock fracturing in there. So there are things moving around. And then we get into this harmonic tremor that's shown here at the bottom. And that's essentially, it's like an organ pipe that's vibrating as the gases are, are, trans, um, are moving through that system and allowing um, and showing that things are, that there is unrest and that there's significant gas in the system that could show that, that uh, an eruption is likely. Um, using remote sensing, um, there are all sorts of fantastic instruments fly, flying around in space these days. Um, that are getting increasingly high levels of uh, precision and detail on the ground. So we can really look at thermal um, anomalies in, in spectacular detail. Um, and with some of the forward looking infrared um, cameras that we can now take out and, and see exactly what's happening, whether it's in the dark or um, under snow cover, all sorts of things, we can really look at the, th uh, the thermal picture of what's happening on the ground. And this is, is very useful for knowing when there's unrest at a volcano that is not being shown by other signs. Um, I won't really go into too much into deformation because um, we're sort of running slow on, low on time. Um, but you can see that, again, using multiple satellites, we essentially get like a stereographic image that shows how, what the difference is from one time to the next to show how much the ground is moving up or down. Um, with gas monitoring, as I said, this is like taking a blood sample. Um, flying, oftentimes this will be flying under a volcanic plume. Um, these are from two flights from Augustine Volcano. And really, look, really looking for the changes in SO2 to show, to see is, are those levels increasing or decreasing to see whether there's a new injection of magma or not. Uh, it can also be done from satellite. So with a few final minutes, I'm going to talk very briefly about four of my personal favorite eruptions um, in no particular order. Um, the, the first is the, the largest eruption of the 20th century, which occurred in the Alaska Peninsula um, and what gets a lot of different names. It's sometimes people say Katmai, it really came out of the, a new vent of Novarupta and it formed what is now known as the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. It's had a very unusual event. So here in this picture behind me and my friends, um, you see this beautiful caldera lake. Um, it is, a, I can't remember the exact width of the caldera, there's a map in a second. This is what collapsed. This, this hole in the ground formed during this eruption, but no magma was erupted from this mountain. This is around behind me <laughs> the other way. So this um, on the left-hand side of the map, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there is a, an X in the purple um, next to the big lake. Um, and this is the Katmai Caldera where the first picture was taken. The second was taken here next to the letters TE and looking to the sort of north, uh, northwest across the um, bit with the letter N. So the bit with the letter N you can see has a diameter about a large diameter about three kilometers. <clears throat> and that is this lump here in the, the lower right hand photo. And this was there was no volcano here prior to this eruption in 1912. This was just a valley between several other volcanoes. And the magma that came out at this point filled in this entire all this sort of um, beige color here, the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Um, filled it with many cubic kilometers of pyroclastic flows. And you can see uh, an older photo of it here looking in the opposite direction. So this was very uh, important because it showed us that we can have in anywhere in a volcanic region, we can have a new vent open at any time. And you can also have magma moving laterally underground um, many kilometers um, that, 
that there's no there's actually no physical restraint if you have some sort of conduit or if you have a, a fracture system um there's there's no problem with that um and then obviously it makes sense if you drain things out from under one place then that's going to collapse even if you didn't have an eruption there and this was very a globally significant eruption um, there were many reports of damage to household goods and machinery here in C around Seattle um, that was more than 2,000 kilometers away. Now, obviously, there weren't a lot of people flying around in jets in 1912, so we didn't have a major aviation catastrophe, um, but we did have a significant cooling period um, for two years from that because of the sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, one of my absolute personal favorite volcanic eruptions is um, Mount St. Helens. Um, this is actually people wearing masks, different kind of different year of masks, um, were to not breathe in the ashes from these. And that was my first memory as a child is of people wearing painters masks um, because I grew up in Eastern Washington and when this event occurred and this was the first major explosive eruption within the continental US. Um, and it was a, it was really quite an unexpected event to the scientists who were working on it at the time. And Mount St. Helens continues to be a source of great scientific study. And we've learned an incredible amount by the work that's been done there in the intervening years in the 35 years since. Um, actually, no, sorry, we're at 40 years now. <laughs> um, the, the, the sequence of events was roughly that we had this beautiful conical stratovolcano and it started to show signs of unrest. The USGS volcanologists were very well aware that something was going on. The north side of it was, was really bulging out. Um, and unfortunately there were, the Hawaiian volcanologists were brought in and they were like, oh, that's fine. You know, we see this kind of, you know, inflation, deflation all the time, you know, don't worry about it so much. Now, this was unfortunately not the best advice and they had their observatory on that, that north side. And when suddenly that north end gave way, it was like uncorking a bottle of champagne and all the pressurized gas ha had a mas massive lateral blast and um, a re released this plinian eruption um, into the heavens and completely obliterated everything to the north side. So an entire pine forest was just laid flat like hairs being brushed down. Um, and, and the devastation around that area is still seen today. Um, this was, as far as we knew at that time, it was a fairly uncommon succession of events. Um, however, more recent studies and collaborations around the world have shown that this is actually not all that uncommon. We look at other cascade volcanoes and we see these collapse um, um, events throughout almost all of their histories at some point in time. And the exact same sequence of events occurred at Besmignani volcano in Kamchatka in 1956. And so it's one of the, the collateral damages of things like the Cold War, where we had scientists from two countries who were unable to talk to each other. Um, but had they been speaking, they would have seen, the Russian volcanologists could have told us that this was about to happen at Mount St. Helens and, and lives would have been saved. Um, Hello, sorry for yeah. the interruption. Uh, yeah. the, the geologist who predicted the eruption in St. Helens. Please, please, right please sir, in sir, please uh, ask question afterwards, not in the same uh, way. This is uh, for the moment that geologist yeah. died in that eruption. No, no, sir, please, you ask your questions after the session is over. We have already informed everyone. Please do not ask any question during the presentation. Please. Okay. All right. Um, another one that was very important was Mount, Mount Unzen. And this, the, the critical part about um, that we learned, we were able to learn so much from Mount Unzen is because it was a fully geophysically monitored eruption, the first one. And why I say that is because that there, were, there was a full seismic array around the volcano prior to the injection of magma for this. So we were able to get the entire um, picture of this. Mount St. Uh, Enzen went through a five-year period of these domes being built and collapsing into pyroclastic flows, which devastated parts of um, Kyushu, of Shimabara, 
And you can see here this very large area that's been completely destroyed and people had to be evacuated for the most part of five years. Um, we learned a huge amount about how magma moves beneath surfaces and the timing relationships between seismic activity and eruptions. So they actually became very good at timing. They would see a certain type of seismicity in a certain part of the volcano and be able to issue an evacuation warning for a very short period of time. And that actually um, helped with the confidence that people had in, in following the evacuation orders um, because it, became, it was very precise. Uh, and we understand the dynamics of pyroclastic flows much better now because of some of the evidence that came from this eruption. Um, and finally, this led to a major international collaborative um, drilling program. Um, where we were actually able to drill into the conduit region just 15 years after the eruption. And we're able to see the incredibly high rates of alteration that occurred in that system that no one ever thought that um, rates of weather, uh, sorry, rates of alteration could occur um, that fast is what we found there. Um, and finally, Mount Pinatubo, I've already touched on this a bit. Um, this really was a, a huge learning lesson again. It was a major international collaboration between scientists from two countries. Um, and again, as with the Katmai eruption, it led to a long period of global cooling. Um, the sequence at, at Pinatubo was quite complex, um, but thankfully there was a good understanding of the geology around the volcano and the scientists ha were well aware that it was capable of doing something quite devastating. Um, the June 15th event um, unfortunately coincided with Typhoon Yuna, and this is what really made the eruption so massive and so devastating. But thousands of lives were saved, thankfully, by excellent geoscience communication and cultural understanding of, and were able to evacuate tens of thousands of people um, from this area and massively reduce the catastrophic loss of life that would have occurred otherwise. Um, and we, we learned, again, we learned all sorts of things about eruption dynamics, but I know I'm running out of time and I can ask questions if we have <laughs> any moments left. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. It was a wonderful thing and uh, wonderful oh, uh, informative also. And you have shown all the many case studies of that. It was very important. Now I'm unmuting Lips, sir, and uh, Sudha, madam. Lips, sir, I have, I have unmuted you. Please unmute yourself so that you can participate in the discussions. Only two persons are going to be unmuted. I request the rest of them not to speak. Sudha, madam. Professor Lips. Yes. Uh, we'd like to hear from you also, sir. Can you say something? Yes, that was an excellent talk. Thank you very much. I really appreciated it. I can tell I haven't been in, in the lecture theater in a while. <laughs> My timing's off. <up. laughs> I, think, I think Zooming is a little different too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you can't see your audience. Very. <laughs> so Did there you, you are, there you are in Australia. <laughs> and as I recall, there are no active volcanoes in Australia, right? What there do you, you do? Are wrong. <laughs> what? Um, Victoria actually has um, an act, what is geologically an active volcanic field, the Western volcanic field, uh, which stretches roughly from um, the sort of outer Western suburbs of Melbourne into Eastern South Australia. And the, the youngest eruptions from that are at about 12 and 5,000 years ago. So geologically speaking, that is still active. Um, there is still new magma coming up from the mantle in that region. It's a very unusual, it doesn't fit into those three <coughs> zones that I said at the very beginning. Um, I have a whole nother hour long talk about that, <laughs> that volcanic field, um, but I have right under my desk maybe I did where did it go I had a massive mantle xenolith I don't have it anymore it ran away 
<laughs> my children stole it. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's a place where we have fresh mental material coming directly up to the surface. That's from Mount Unzen. Hello. And there's a, there's a nice sized piece of the mantle for you. Completely oh. unmelted and undifferentiated, wrapped in a, in a lava bomb. I don't want to drop this on my computer. Um, and that is from the Western Victorian volcanic field. Um, and it's a beautiful place if you're really into peridot. It's where the, the best peridots in the world come from. So there you go. You all learned something today. <laughs> but there's no places where there's fuming la lava coming out. Not at the moment, but there's no right. reason that we couldn't have a, a, new, a new one any day. It's <laughs> just to top off 2020. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> no, Melvin's been through enough already, thanks. <laughs> Actually, and I'm sitting on an ancient volcano right here, so most people don't know that most of, of Victoria actually is a huge old um, volcanic field, but the volcano that I'm actually sitting inside of now um, was active during the Devonian, so uh, it's, it's been quiet for a while. No worries. Okay, thank you. Sudha Madam? S Sudha Madam is not responding. I have unmuted Sudha Madam. Sudha no, Madam? Okay. I think okay. you can take questions, I think. If okay, but we'll take only a few questions because this is a concluding session. And uh, so we are short of time. So we'll take only one or two questions and can I, you can direct. Sorry, can, can, I, can I ask a question? No, please, please, afterwards, please, afterwards. Please sure. write in your uh, chat mode, sir. Uh, so All the please. questions should be in the chat mode only. Uh, Dennis has asked which countries around the world have most active and explosive volcanoes? Yeah, um, so Indonesia really takes the cake. Um, <laughs> Indonesia is basically just hundreds of active explosive volcanoes. Um, uh, surprisingly, Kamchatka, which is part of Russia, most people don't think of Russia as having a lot of volcanoes, but the Kamchatkan volcanoes are extremely um, active. So that is where we have the, somebody asked a little bit more, um, that's where the, the northwesternmost corner of the Pacific Ocean is diving between the Aleutian Arc and then the Kamchatkan Peninsula, which then um, trends down into the Kuril um, Islands between Hokkaido, northern Japan. So all along that area, we have um, extremely active volcanoes and um, the, there's a very strong collaboration now between um, the US and Russia for monitoring that because most of the ashes from those volcanoes actually affect US air traffic space. Um, and so we've, we've uh, um, spent quite a lot of time working in that area and in, in the projects to um, increase the seismic and deformation monitoring, as well as to understand those systems better. <laughs> I see a question here about Deccan volcanism. Um, I, I did, I personally grew up on the Columbia River basalts, which are also a flood, flood basalt plain, um, but I, it's really not my area of specialty. I've sort of driven over the Deccan um, part, a little corner of the Deccan plains there, but um, I really don't know anything about that. It's flood, flood volcanism is a whole subspecialty of this subspecialty. So I can't really speak to that one, sorry. Are there any active volcanoes in the Indian Ocean? Yes, isn't, uh, isn't that where um, the French one, isn't that down there? Uh, <laughs> not. It is uh, Fornesa, it is Fornesa. Fornesa, Pitoda La Fornesa. Mar South of Mauritius. Uh, I'd like to ask, questions about white island volcano eruptions can you just uh, say something about 
Yeah, so right. I, think, I think I saw sort of that question in the chat there. Um, so okay. the reason that there were no precursors for that eruption in December last year is that it was a phreatic eruption. And so what that means is essentially that we had a pressure cooker where we had a really tight lid and the, and the steam was building up and building up and the release valve failed and the entire pressure cooker exploded. Okay, so at White Island, most of the volcano, more, um, about 70% of the volcano sits below sea level. So you have a huge amount of seawater that interacts with the magma within the volcano itself, um, which generates an, a, a lot of steam. Okay, so anytime you have any, any magma within that system, it's going to be turning that water to steam. And most of the time, White Island is releasing that steam very actively. Okay, White Island is, is well known for it's just continuous plume that's coming off of it. But if for some reason we have more precipitation occurring at depth and that system gets plugged up, it's like if your, your plumbing and your house gets all jammed up, eventually there's going, something's going to give. And that's what happened in that eruption. That's why there were no precursors because there wasn't, um, there was no new magma that came in it was simply that the, the system sort of sealed itself off. Something was different. There, were, there was some change in the color of the water at the surface. So maybe there was a new crack that opened somewhere, um, but there was nothing. It didn't give us um, the normal seismic changes or the, um, uh, the deformation changes because there was no new magma that was injected. There was actually no magma that was erupted at that. It was a completely a steam eruption. And the reason that we see it as being devastating was that there were people right there in the vent. Um, and if you look at the um, GNS warning levels for the volcanoes in New Zealand, you'll see that even at level two, that only indicates that it's possible that there might be an eruption that's going to affect, affect the crater area. And because basically all of White Island is the volcanic crater, going out there and being there, you, there's, there's nothing to warn you that, to, that something's going to happen. So there was almost no chance that those people could have avoided it other than not to go there as tourists. Sunil, I think you can take one more question. Yeah. Uh, any comments on uh, volcanoes in Andaman and Nicobar? I'm not sure where those <laughs> are. Okay. 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 Um, I don't. I don't know where the. Uh, any... <laughs> I'm not sure who that question was from. Um, are those. There, there are hundreds and hundreds of volcanoes around the world, so I, I don't, I don't know every single one. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Sunil, we can ask uh, Pramila, madam. We'll go to the next. Yeah, I request Pramila, madam, to continue. Now the question yes. answer session is over, and a lot of many people have said nice, very nice comments. I'll not repeat. They are on chat mode. Thank you. Thank you very much. Leslie, madam, once again. I request uh, yes. Pramila, madam. To... After this wonderful talk by Dr. Leslie, I think you've given a very insightful talk on so many things. There are some things which are aware, one is aware of, and then the in-depth study to it kind of gives so much more elaboration to it. So thank you very much, ma'am. It was a wonderful talk. I would like to now uh, invite Dr. Vartak to introduce Dr. Professor Roberto Greco who is the chair of the IGO. And I request her to please come along and uh, give his concluding remarks for the session as well as for the summing up the week. Dr. Vartak, now I uh, ask you to please continue. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Robert Greco, chair IGO. He did his PhD in School of Earth System Science, Environmental Resources and Cultural Heritage from University of Modena and Regina Emiliva, Italy. Presently, he is professor at the Institute of Geosciences, Unicam, Brazil. 
is member of international union geological sciences is member of the commission on education training and technology transfer he is executive council member of the international association for promoting geoethics and he is chair international geoscience organization igo with this short introduction now i request professor roberto to give his concluding remarks for this earth science week Uh, good morning. Uh, you hear me and see yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are you yeah. are visible, sir. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to for the final remark of the this Earth Science Week, and uh, congratulations for all the organization of uh, this week. I give a look uh, in the uh, YouTube channel at uh, the video that you record. And, uh, and that is also a really good idea to make available even outside this week, this excellent material in order that all the people that are interested and uh, we hope also teachers, school teacher could have the opportunity to learn more about earth science by this, uh, this initiative. Uh, congratulations also to the excellent uh, for the excellent talk of this uh, uh, today of uh, Leslie, and uh, well, I would like to present a little uh, IGO in order to understand also the relation with uh, with the Earth Science uh, uh, Week and uh, the education and outreach activity. Uh, IGO is uh, the acronym for the International Geoscience Education Organization. That is an organization that uh, uh, born 20 years ago and uh, nowadays have around 40 countries that participate. There is a representative also from India and uh, we organize every four years uh, international conference on earth science education and we already host a conference in earth science education even in India a few years ago. The next one will be in Japan. In uh, our website we have several material, teaching material and uh, textbook and uh, a suggestion for uh, activity that could be done in school about earth science education because earth science education is the main aims of this association to improve the teaching and to share good practice and to improve the curricular experience of uh, the child of the student all around the world about earth science because we, we we, we know that the importance of the earth science for the life of all the citizens all around the world. And uh, we are uh, particularly uh, worried about the situation all around the world about energy, resources, water, climate change, uh, soil erosion are some of the topics that uh, uh, make uh, really important and necessary for all the people all around the world have uh, at least a basic knowledge about the function of our planet. So for that reason, I am uh, uh, really happy about the uh, Earth Science Week uh, initiative and the initiative that we, your association have done in during this week in India, because for sure it will contribute for the uh, for spread earth science education, earth science uh, knowledge around India. So thank you for uh, for this uh, earth science week. I know that is a big effort to put all together um, participant and. Uh, speaker, especially in this time of pandemic. So congratulations for uh, your big effort. And uh, I hope that the uh, collaboration with IGO 
will uh, continue and for sure IGO will support and continue to support all the initiative like uh, you have done during this week. Thanks, Professor Ajit. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your kind words and uh, also this that there can be more of collaborative work that can be done. Thank you once again. Uh, I once again invite Dr. Vartak to conclude this session with a vote of thanks. On behalf of our entire organization, Maharashtra Uksha Samvardhini, our team, even special guests from the fraternity, I extend a very heart, hearty vote of thanks to all those who helped us during this Earth Science Week 2020. Our special thanks to Professor Nitin Karmalkar, sir, Vice Chancellor Savitribai Phule, Pune University, for sparing his valuable time to inaugurate this Earth Science Week 2020. A big thank you to all our guests Speakers, Professor Jerry Lips, Mr. Arvind Auti, Dr. Par Chavan, Dr. Sanjeev Nalavade, Dr. Ian Make, Dr. Dhananjay Mohabe, Professor R. Shankar, and Dr. Leslie Almberg. We are also grateful to Professor Robert Greco, Chair IGO, for his concluding remarks. I may like to express my sincere thanks to my friends, colleagues, Professor R. Shankar, Professor Pramila Dasture, Mr. Kaustub Mudgal, Mr. Sunil Bhide, Mr. Sharad Fatak and all our Maharashtra Vuksha Samvarni team members for their constant support to organize this Earth Science Week 2020. No program can be success without an audience. We have been rather fortunate to have had a dedicated set of participants who have been with us through this Earth Science Week 2020. At the Maharashtra Vuksha Samvardini, we have been getting a number of inquiries for our further programs related to Earth Sciences. We certainly have certain plans in store, but it would be wonderful to get suggestions from you all about which topics we should touch upon with probable speakers or the nature of events. Please write to us. Our email ID is missiondevrai at gmail.com. Over this Earth Science Week and our various programs, we have been fortunate to have built a network of speakers and audiences from across India and overseas. This gives me and Maharashtra Vuksha Samvardhini a hope that we can together put in efforts to build a voice that can save our mother earth from the anthropogenic damages. With this, we conclude with this morning session and this Earth Science Week 2020. Once again, a big thank you to one and all. Thank you. So I think uh, Sunil, we can yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful cooperation and making this a successful event.